Introducing Vinia, a new miracle superfood from the Holy Land that is clinically proven to increase your blood circulation and the delivery of oxygen, resulting in improved physical energy and mental alertness. So order your Vinia today at ViniaBloodFlow.com or call 800-600-3619. Vinia, changing blood flow forever. The Lord wants a walking, living relationship. And out of that living, walking relationship that we have with Him, He directs our paths. So, and so I, 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 I believe what God does is He will show us just enough to get us walking the right direction. But you know, you may think, okay, God's calling me here and I'm here right now, right? right. You may think, simple, bam, right there. No, you go through this wilderness, this desert, this crucible, this attack, and then all of a sudden you find yourself here. So you know what, it's so fun, this topic that we want to talk about because, John, I want to dive right into it because you have so much knowledge, you have so much information I know you can just download to us. And, and you know, you can get knowledge on Google, but you need wisdom. You guys know what I'm talking about? I mean, that's what we really need is, is wisdom today about how do you discover God's purpose, God's calling for your life. Everyone has a unique calling. And uh, I think people get confused on what that is, what that looks like. And today it seems like everyone thinks their calling is just to be famous, right? Just yep. to be on TV yep. or, you know, to be, you know, have your own reality show or YouTube channel or whatever. And I think we're missing something. And so could you just unpack with us, how do you discover your calling? You know, let's just start with that. With me, it's, it's very interesting. As a, as a young boy, I remember going to the Catholic Church and I was scared because I felt something tugging me. Now that was before I really wasn't sensitive to the Lord anymore. And I remember then, you know, as a, you know, a big full on sinner. I mean, I did what sinners are supposed to do. I sinned really sure. good. And um, I remember once I got saved in my college fraternity at Purdue University, that little pull towards ministry came back. But honestly, Bill, ministry was the last thing I ever wanted to do wow. because every minister I'd ever met was weird. Now, I have to say this, please. Um, I grew up in a town of 3,000. Gotcha. Okay, so I'm a Catholic boy. So my concept of ministry is either you never get married, which that scared me like crazy. Right. Um, or if you end up as a pastor, there was only one pastor in that little town that I knew. And he had a very smelly house and really weird kids. And I was like, okay. So I, I resisted it and resisted it and resisted it. And Finally, a couple events occurred with me that got my attention. One was I was studying engineering. And as a co-op engineer, we would work at IBM for a semester and go to Purdue for a semester. And we were celebrating an engineer's 38th year with IBM. And there was 14 engineers sitting around the room. They're all drinking their coffee. I can't drink coffee. I got too much energy for that. So anyway, I'm just sitting there talking with them while they're drinking their coffee. And this guy says... I've hated every day I've walked in here for 38 years. And everybody laughed in the office except me. I was horrified. Wow. And I looked at him and I said, why did you do it? And he said, and he got a little upset with me. He goes, John, it's a job. You know, you earn money so you can eat and buy clothes. And I was like, shut up, Bevere. And I remember, I didn't say another word in that office, but I, I, made, I made a note in my mind and in my heart 38 years from now, I will not be saying what he's saying. Wow. And I remember my senior year, that was my junior year that happened. My senior year, I called my mom, and <laughs> you tried doing this with your Roman Catholic Italian mother. I said, Mom, I'm not coming home for Thanksgiving. And her first thing was, what are you going to eat? And I said, Mom, don't worry about it. And I fasted. All my fraternity brothers went home that Thanksgiving. I fasted, and I said, God, i got to know why you put me on this earth. And as a result of that fast... God gave me glimpses of things I didn't do until I was in my 50s. I have it written down, docu dated wow. um, the 1981, and yet I didn't see some of the fulfillment until I was in my 50s. Now, that's what God always does. He shows, shows Joseph, you're going to be a great leader. Your brothers are going to serve you, right? right? But he doesn't show them the pit, the slavery of 10 years, and the dungeon of two years. Right. You know, he shows David, you're going to be, you know, a leader. But he doesn't show him living in the wilderness for the next 14 years of your life and making pillows, you're, you're, you know, out of rocks. Right. So, you know, God showed me that, but I had no idea the road that I was going to travel. So the first thing, though, that I think is so important to say to everybody that's watching us is that God has called every one of us. 
You know, the, the old mindset is, well, just pastors or missionaries or worship leaders have a call of God on their life. No, every single human being, if you are born again, God has placed a call on your life, and that call is to build up the church in various different ways. It's good. It's good. So you're telling me... So you're, you're telling me that I don't have to be a pastor, I don't have to be a minister, I don't have to necessarily, you know, get a paycheck from some kind of church or, you know, religious institution. I can be just as called by God working at a local, you know, college. I can be just as called yeah. by God being in the military. I can be just as called by God, you know, selling cars at the local car dealership. You know, a friend of mine, he's actually where my son's interning right now. He, um... He, he got saved in the early 90s, and all that was preached in his church is, hey, the only way you can serve God is be in ministry. So he's, he became a youth pastor, and he was a youth pastor for five years. And he said, John, I couldn't make ends meet. I was having to clean houses just to survive. Yeah. And he said, finally, after five years in prayer and listening to a man of God, he realized, wait a minute, I'm not called to ministry. I'm called to the business world. Now today he has... I think five different states and his business is in five different states and he's given over a million dollars into the kingdom. Wow. Another friend of mine, I, I love this man so deeply. Um, he, was, he was raised in the church and he thought the only way I can really serve God because he said, John, I had a passion to serve God is to go to um, Bible school. So he did and he went for two years and then he interned in a church on, on the third year. He was accused of sleeping with a girl in the youth group because he was interning in the youth group of this very large church. And he said, John, I never slept with her, but the elders believed her. So they threw me out and they took away all my credentials. He said, John, three years of work completely gone. And that's a lot when you're 21 years yeah, old. Is. So he said, John, to be honest with you, I sought God like I've never sought God before. And he said, um, God speaks to me and said, I didn't call you to ministry. I called you to military. Hmm. And he was like, whoa. So he went to the Air Force, the Marines. He went to the Army, nothing. He said, last one's the Navy. He's sitting in the recruiting office. He has no idea, absolutely no idea what a SEAL is. But the guy's reading down the list and he says the word SEALs. And when he does, he goes, that's it. That's what I'm supposed to do. The recruiter goes, no, 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 no. 90% of the guys flunk out. You don't want to do this. All of us have flunked out in this office. He goes, no, that's what I'm supposed to do. What neither of them knew was that he didn't know how to swim as a seal. <laughs> and there's a reason because he had tubes put in his ears because his ear canals were so narrow. And he said, John, if I just got a couple drops of water in my ear, I was in excruciating pain. So he had to teach himself how to swim, pray through the pain every day and say, God, I'm believing you to heal my ears. He said, one day I go down two feet, five feet, 10 feet, totally nothing. Wow. So now he's in SEAL training. He steps in a hole on the beach on the last week of SEAL training and tears everything from knee down to ankle. His Navy SEAL physical was that week. He said, if you flunk the physical, you can never become a SEAL. Wow. I go into that physical. He said, the doctor flunks me. He said, Doc, this, this is what I know God has called me to do. You can't do this. And the doc says, are you questioning me? I'm an officer. He said, no, sir, and he left, and one of his friends saw how dejected he was. He said, hey, why don't you come to this Bible study a bunch of us have been going to? So he goes to the Bible study. Well, he doesn't know this. The guy leading the Bible study is an officer above the doctor. And you know what he's teaching them? How to be led by the Spirit. And you know what he says? He says, you know, like yesterday, I had an application come across my desk. The doctor denied him on the physical. I felt it was wrong, so I overrode it. After the Bible study, he found out he was the one. Wow. So he's got chills. That's so crazy. He's just retiring this year after 20 years. He's not only a Navy SEAL, he's a Navy SEAL instructor. Wow. I remember we sat at this restaurant and him telling me this story for two hours in Hawaii. I was doing a conference in Hawaii and I heard that he wanted to meet me and a Navy SEAL instructor wants to meet me. I'm going to that dinner. And <laughs> I remember calling Lisa when I got home. I said, Lisa, I've been in the presence of a man of God for the last two hours. I've had probably the most rich presence of God in a dinner I've, I've probably had before. Wow. And yet he's a Navy SEAL instructor. I mean, he was telling me stories of their combats for like an hour and a half, like his phone turning itself on, on a crossfire ambush, calling his mother who just happened to be in her prayer group, 
they pray for the safety, they should have all been dead. They get the Al-Qaeda, they get out, none of them are injured. I mean, wow. stories like that, you're just going, okay, you're called to be a military. <laughs> and so that's the first thing every one of us have to understand. And sometimes the callings that are so important to God yeah. and so important to life are insignificant in men's eyes. I mean, I believe it's a great calling to be a mother. Yeah. I believe to raising children yeah. is a great calling. Yeah. And, 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 and mothers sometimes can go, well, I'm not doing anything for God. What are you talking about? God has entrusted you the lives of these children. Yeah. You know, I look at my wife, Lisa, knew she was called to speak and write. Lisa's a New York Times bestseller. She speaks to tens of thousands of women, right? But she looked at me and she said, John, I know I'm called to travel, but I know I'm first of all called to raise these four sons. Where would my sons be today yeah. had my wife, you know, been anxious and wanted to be out on the speaking circuit? My wife realizes that to be in ministry is service. Yeah. It's not glamorous. It's, you're, not, you're not out there trying to build a name for yourself. She was just like, God, I really don't want to do this. I mean, she, yeah. she lost an eye when she was five years old to cancer. Mm. She got out of the required speech course in high school. She got out of the typing because of depth perception. What does she do now? She speaks and she types she books. Types. Wow. I mean, so, so crazy. you know, the, and, and, and you know what Lisa used to say to me? She said, I hate women. I don't, I, I don't like women. I, it bothered me, Bill. It really bothered me. <laughs> and so I come in from this meeting one day and she's, she's got tears in her eyes and she'd been crying for two hours and she said, John, I said, God's been in this room. She said, yeah. He told me, Lisa, you don't like women, do you? She goes, no. He said, Lisa, I love women. And she said, John, I've been crying. I have such a passion for women now. Wow. And so I've watched her just li literally her heart break over women. That's a calling. That's somebody who said, God, I'm your girl. I'll do whatever you want. And God ends up having her do what she really didn't want to do. The last thing on earth I ever wanted to do was to be in ministry. My plans were to go to Harvard, get my MBA, and then go into corporate uh, management and make a lot of money, marry a pretty girl, take three vacations a year and tithe to my local church. That's how I was going to serve God. Yeah. But yet the last thing I wanted to do was to be in ministry, yet God's like, and now I look at it and I'm like, oh, I can't imagine doing anything else but what he's called me to do. And so that's the first thing. When you delight yourself in the Lord, when you passionately love Jesus, he will place his desires in your heart. So right. what I thought was, would be a horrible life right. of ministry, right. and I said that to God. I said, God, if I live in a shack, I got weird kids, or I end up, you know, in Africa with nothing to eat, I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to preach because you want me to, and I love you that much. When you love God that way, he puts his desires in your heart. Now the thing I dreaded, I absolutely love doing, and it's my life. Wow. So that's so number one. That's so good. So that's a long first point. No, I love it? it. It's amazing. So you, so, you, so you're telling me that you know you, you delight yourself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. That's interesting. No, no. I believe that. Yeah, He'll place His desires in your heart. In your heart. He'll give right. you, grant you the desires of your heart. You you quoted it correctly, mm -hmm. but the way I heard it, I want to make sure everybody's hearing yeah, it right yeah, yeah. out there. I don't believe you delight yourself in the Lord and He'll give you. Oh, I want a house. I want, right. it's not I want a big car. Lord. I want a jet. You know. Right. No. You delight yourself in the Lord and his desires that he has for you, he'll place in your heart. So he becomes your delight over the other things. Gotcha. We've got a great audience. Gotcha. Yeah, we do. We do. I love it. So you're, so, so that's how you discovered your, your purpose. Now, let me ask you something. What's changed over the years for your, for your calling? Yeah, does, does, it does it change? Does it change over time? It does change. Look at my friend now. He's coming out of the Navy SEALs. He's retiring and he's dealing with this question. Yeah. Okay, God, what's the next step now? Yeah. So. You know, I've, I've, watched, I've watched people go through seasons. There are right. seasons to our callings. Um, you know, I look at me and, you know, I've been writing and traveling the world and preaching, but now I have this desire to coming in my heart to be a father, to raise up sons and daughters and, and, and have them carry the messages that God has entrusted to Lisa and I. So we see that shift coming now for the next several years. That's and good. so... I'm taking notes, man. Keep talking. Keep talking. <laughs> I love it. when you, He does this with me in restaurants. So okay. good. And so I, it's and, good, isn't it? I and, mean, come and, on. And seasons are so powerful. I love that. There are seasons to so our good. callings. And so, so what may have been God's will 10 years ago may not be his will now. So that means, you see, God never wants, wants us to have formulas. 
He said, when you seek me and search me with all of your heart, that's when I'll be found by you. So in other words, God, what we want is we want, God, tell me what to do. Step one, two, three, and I got it. Goodbye, God. I've got it now. Wow. The Lord wants a walking, living relationship. And out of that living, walking relationship that we have with him, he directs our paths. So and good. so I, 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 I believe what God does is he will show us just enough to get us walking the right direction. But, you know, you may think, okay, God's calling me here and I'm here right now, right? right. You may think, simple, bam, right there. No, you go through this wilderness, this desert, this crucible, this attack, and then all of a sudden you find yourself here. Yeah. You couldn't even see here when you were going through this desert and crucible over here. But now all of a sudden he gets you there. It's like Joseph. Yeah. I mean, you know, God, of course, doesn't tell Joseph, hey, you're going to get thrown into a pit. Your brothers are going to betray you. You will serve as a slave. Doesn't this sound great, Joseph? No. <laughs> If you look at you Joseph when up. he started, he was a tattletale. He was yeah. a bragger. He didn't have character to handle the position God wanted for him. And, and so God says, all right, for you to do what I really want you to do, I need to develop this character in you. And you may not like how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it. And I think one of the, my sons, you know, they'll, they'll ask Lisa and I lots of questions. And my son said, dad, what, 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 one day he said to me, what was the most important prayer, most effective, important prayer you ever prayed for your calling. And I said, I don't even have to think about it. I know what it was. And he said, what? And I said, I asked God and I asked him sincerely and I meant it. And I was young. I said, God, please don't ever allow the anointing you place on my life to exceed the character that you have developed in me. That's good. Because That's I don't good. want it destroying me. And I don't want it bringing shame yeah. to your name. Yeah, that's good. And, and that's, that's what frightens yeah. me. And I've told my sons this. I've told my family. I said, hey, I've given God permission to take me off the earth if I ever yeah. bring shame to him and hurt his people. I don't want that. I started in love with Jesus. I want to end this, this journey in love with Jesus you know, and, yeah. and, and, his, and, and his people. And I want to be more in love with Jesus and more in love with his people when I end it than when I started it. So good. So, um, yeah, there's seasons and we have to recognize those seasonal changes and we flow with it. So very, very important. But you know, can I, can I, can I dress something? And, and, am I going too long? Or no, you're we, going. Just keep going. Okay. This cause, cause this may take a We're few minutes. We're all loving this, right? right? This is great. Keep, keep going, man. This is great. I really want to unpack the character stuff. Cause that's, that's such a big deal. Just about, you know, we live in a world that everyone wants this instant success, instant, like, you know, oh, I prayed and then God gave me this huge ministry. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> okay. So let me, uh, you know, Lisa and I, we laugh a lot because people are, you know, you, they think, oh, you guys became success overnight. And Lisa's like, you have no idea what we've walked through. But I remember back in when I prayed that, and I said, God, I never want your, the anointing you've placed on my life to exceed yeah. the character you've developed in me. So I, I remember shortly after that, um, I started going through trials like I'd never faced before. Mm. I mean, I got demoted three levels in my church and I didn't do anything wrong because what happened was they moved me into a position and the position didn't work out. And the only position they had left with 400 employees on this church staff was three levels down. And wow. I remember I'm going through everything. All, all this stuff's going on. And I remember I'm living in perpetual pain. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm getting up in pain. I'm going to work in pain. I'm coming home and I, I just got this pain in me. Yeah. And one day, I remember, I just closed my door and I just put my head up against the door and I said, God, why do I hurt so bad inside? Yeah. And the Lord said, because you're dying. Hmm. And he said, there's always pain in death. And he said, do you want to know how you're going to know when you're, when you're dead? I said, how? He said, when you don't hurt anymore, dead people don't hurt. I said, God, kill me quick, please. Hmm. And so um, in that time period, I was yelling at Lisa. I mean, I was flying off the handle at everything. I mean, you know, she's wow. Sicilian. I'm, a, I'm an Italian. Come on, she's Apache Indian. She's got <laughs> Arab in her. We're, we're too hot. All the personality, the personality test we took, the best one says we never should have gotten married, okay, because <laughs> of how A-type and, you know, but anyway. And yet we're so, we're more in love with each other today than the day we married each other. But anyway, that's another. But I'm yelling at Lisa. Addison was nine months old. I'm yelling at him. I'm mad at my friends. I'm mad at my pastor. I'm mad at everybody, yeah. right? So one day, I'm like getting a little concerned. I've never been angry.
angry like this before. I've always been a happy guy, right? And so I, was, I, I remember I was walking out in the field and I said, God, I've been really angry the last six months, angry at everything. I said, what do I cast out? What, what, what do I have to come against? And I remember the Lord said, you can't cast out flesh, son. I was like, okay. And he said, son, I have brought you into my furnace of affliction. Isaiah 45, right? And he said, meet with my engineering background. I got to make this really simple. So if there's technical people watching us right now, you're going to think I'm making this too simple, but I'm doing this so everybody can understand it. He said, son, look at the gold ring on your finger. And I said, I looked at it and he said, does it look like pure gold? I said, yeah. He said, but it's not, is it? Now, as an engineering background, I knew a 14 karat gold ring was 14 parts out of 24 parts gold and 10 parts out of 24 parts impurities, other metals such as copper, zinc, nickel. He said, but you look at that ring, it looks pure. I said, yeah. He said, you put it in a furnace, what happens? I said, well, you, they heat the furnace up to 7,000 degrees Fahrenheit. I said, the gold liquefies. He said, then what happens? I, I said, the impurities come to the surface. He said, they appear, right? I said, yeah. He said, they were always in there, weren't they? I said, yeah. He said, they just come to the surface. I said, yeah. He said, I've brought you in my furnace of affliction. Wow. And he said, you keep saying, where's all this anger? Where's all this stuff coming from? Yeah. He said, it was always there. It was always there. It was there. Wow. He said, I saw it, but you didn't. He said, what wow. I've done is brought you in this furnace for your sake so you can see it. Wow. He said, now, if you blame your wife, you blame your pastor, you blame your friends, he said, it just goes right back in, and we have to start the process all over again. He said, but if you say, God, forgive me, I am an angry man. Would you take this out of my life? He said, I'll take my ladle, and that's what they do. They scoop off the impurities right off the surface so the gold gets pure. Wow. And you know, it's so good. So good. So good. And, 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 and do, you know, do you know what happens? Do, do, you know, do you know gold in its purest state is soft and pliable and plexible, flexible? Wow. A 14 karat gold ring, it's not, I can't, I can't bend that. It's not soft. It's huh. hard. Okay. The other thing about gold, here in Dallas, they have buildings with sheets of gold on the window. It's very fine, pure gold because gold in its pure state is transparent. So if you look at Malachi, Malachi says, I'm going to send my messenger who's going to prepare the way before me. And the Lord's going to come to his temple. We're his temple. Not for his temple, to it. Yeah. He's going to come to us before he comes for us, right? And he says he's going to come like a refiner's fire. He's going to purify the sons of Levi, which that's the ministers. And he said, but, but he said, when I'm done with this work, he said, two things are going to happen. Some of them are going to complain and some of them are going to fear me. And he says, when that happens, he said, the sun, S-U-N, and read it in Malachi, of righteousness is going to rise with healing in his wings. Wow. I believe that's what he prepares us for. He prepares us for that day in which we'll shine forth with his glory. So the people don't see the vessel, they see the treasure in the vessel because we're transparent. Wow. So good. My goodness. Oh. So God called you. God led you. you yes, sir. You clearly see him doing that. He put you through a refiner's fire, so to speak, where you were, were having to deal with your anger and other issues that came up. So when did you feel, in the words of Isaiah, sent? And how do you know who you're sent to and what to sent to do? Does that make sense? Yeah. How do you know that? Well, now let's, let's talk just ministry. How did I know I was sent? I tried to send myself for years. And God said, you send yourself, you go in your authority. If I send you, you go in my authority. I will never forget it. I was trying to birth my own ministry. I knew I was called. And I, I, I was really frustrated with the Lord. I'll be honest with you. I said, first of all, I don't want anything to do with ministry. Then I accept your calling, and now I'm going nowhere. Right. I'm driving this van for my church for four years, and then I'm a youth pastor for several years, and I'm like, I'm going nowhere. Yeah. And Jesus is coming back in 1988. Right, I right. Gotta you got to hurry up. I gotta, you know, that's my <laughs> attitude, right? And so I'm, I'm, I was, you know, Paul said I was the chiefest of sinners. I used to say I was the chiefest of master strivers. So I am like striving to get God, you know, to move. I'm like, hey, I'm called. So, you know, Marilyn Hickey was coming to our church and she was like, well, John, just go, just go preach in, in the Caribbean. And other people would say, well, just go find a city and start a church. And I'm like, okay, okay, okay. And so I remember 
I had a chance to go overseas and I went overseas to the Philippines and on my way back, I'm reading the gospel of Luke and it says there was a man sent by God whose name was John. It was talking about John the Baptist. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit said, do you want to be sent by you or do you want to be sent by me? Wow. I said, I want to be sent by you. He said, that's a good choice. He said, because if you send yourself, you go in your authority. He said, if I send you, you go in my authority. That's good. So if you look at what God uses, God uses a broken and contrite heart. What does broken mean? When we think of broken, we think the guy or the gal has gone through disaster and they're like flubber. Mm -hmm. That's not broken, okay? If you want to understand broken, look at a horse. You can have a horse that's more gifted, faster, swifter, can jump higher than any other horse in the stables. But when wartime comes, less gifted horses, less swift horses will go to battle while he sits in the stalls. Why? One reason, he's, they're broken, he's not. What does brokenness deal with? When the rider rides this horse into the gunfire, into the swords being yielded, the cannon fire, that horse will not change its course, not even budge, except at the nudge of his rider, which is his master. So true breaking occurs when we really come under what the Americans hate, and that's called authority. You know, we, we in America, we are a people. Here, here's, why, here's why Americans are sometimes the hardest people to communicate the things of God to. And, and, and I know I'm really going to probably make some people upset. But we're a people trying to understand kingdom principles with a democratic mindset. The kingdom of God is not a democracy. Yeah. It's a kingdom, which means it has rank, order, and authority. He's a real king. He's not a figurehead like the lady in England. He's actually a real king. So if you try to relate with God with your democratic mindset, you'll be on two totally different playing fields. God is, is a king. So the thing that had to be broken in me is, first of all, my submission to his direct authority. And then what had to be broken in me was my submission to his delegated authority. Wow. Because the Bible says all authority is of God. Now, that's going to make some people really upset. But the Bible says that. I didn't say that. Yeah. Now, let me make this really clear. The Bible says all authority is of God, but the Bible does not say all authority is godly. Right. There are godly authorities all throughout that Bible. Their authority was from God. Their behavior was not. Right. So God, in his wisdom that's beyond amazing, says, okay, I got the perfect recipe to refine you. I will put you under this leader who I know has these issues now, that doesn't mean I obey that leader if he tells me to sin. The Bible's very clear. Leader tells you to sin, there is a higher authority. Whether we obey right. God or you, you judge. But that's, that's not what mo most Americans deal with. Most Americans deal with the fact they don't like the way their leader's doing it. I mean, if you look at Peter, Peter sticks his foot in his mouth about every time he opens it, right? Mm -hmm. One minute, you're, you're the Christ. The next minute, get behind me, Satan. I mean, you know, you know yeah. walking on water, sinking, right? Well, he's true to form in the upper room. Now, obviously, Jesus leaves him in charge, and he comes busting out of his study one morning, and he says to the 120, oh, my gosh, Judas is right there. He's right there in the book of Psalms. Yeah. I think it's 22. He says, and you know what it says? It says somebody's supposed to replace him. So look out amongst us and find all the guys here in this 120 that have been with us from the beginning that we can pray and draw lots to see who God chooses to replace Judas. Now, you and I know that God does not choose an apostle through a lottery system. Right. Okay? Right. And, 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 you, and, and you see the results of his lottery system. I mean, <laughs> oh my gosh, Matthias wins the lottery. Right. And you never hear his name again the rest of the Bible. Right. Paul was the one that said that I was one born out of due time. Paul was God's choice to replace Judas. Right. But, I mean, if Peter would have done that today... We would have had a three-way church split. Yeah. We would have had the anti-lottery apostle-picking group split off. We would have had the apostles passed away when Jesus ascended to heaven group split off. And we would have had the uh, lottery apostle-picking group stay. <laughs> and yet, the Bible says in the very next verse, they were all with one accord. And because of that, 
the glory of God falls on that city. Mm. And here's the thing that the Holy Spirit said to me one day. He said, did you notice Peter was out of sync with me? Peter wasn't even in sync with God. He wasn't telling them to sin. If yeah. Peter would have said, hey, y'all, we're going to go out and steal. They would have said, Peter, <laughs> we're out of here. Yeah. You, 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 we got to replace yeah. you <laughs> right, right. Okay, or something. I don't know. But he just wanted to pick the apostle with a lottery system by drawing wow. lots. He's out of sync. Paul was the one that God chose because that's why he was born, one born out of due time. But because they were one, the whole city got affected. This is what the Lord put in my heart one day. He said, how many people are going to stand before my throne and have to give an account for the people that weren't reached in their community because they weren't one with the leader I put them under? Wow. Mm. So I'm, I'm convinced, had I not learned this lesson, had I not learned it, I don't believe I'd be sitting on the set right now. I don't believe you ever would have read one book by John Bevere. And I'm going to tell you the greatest test I ever had in this was my, my pastor. I was his youth pastor. And I had done studies. This is back in the mid-1980s. I'd done studies and I found out the fastest, best youth group in the whole country was in Louisiana. I flew there, spent four days with them. I prayed. God said, do it. They were doing these party concepts. 113 parties in the city of Baton Rouge every, every um, Friday night, and the kids would all target an unsaved kid in their high school and invite them to the party. I went to one of the parties. They had four youth pastors in this church. All four youth pastors said, this is the reason why we're growing so strong. And those kids were so passionate about Jesus. I went to their wow. general Wednesday night service, and they were sitting there on the edge of their seats. And I remember going to that party, the music's blasting, they got the chips out, soft drinks, they're having a group, they're, they're, they're just talking. And then this one guy who's the leader, nobody knows he's there's a leader. He starts a discussion, it leads into spiritual things. He gives an altar call, a bunch of them got saved. I saw it with my own eyes. Wow. And then they bring him back to the bedroom, get their, their name and phone yeah, numbers and yeah. get him hooked in. I'm like, this is it, this is it. So I go back and I pray. I say, God, should I do this? And God says, do it. So I see my senior pastor in the parking lot. I tell him about it, he's like, great. So. We spent eight months preparing Orlando, Florida for this, right? We have the curriculum set. I have trained leaders for eight months. We have the houses set, everything set. I'm preaching it to the whole youth group. They're so fired up. Everybody's fired up. We're going to win the city of Orlando, right? And I walk into a pastor's meeting I will never forget. So there's 11 of us pastors sitting around, and our senior pastor goes, the Holy Spirit told me the direction of the church is not to have home groups. So I want you all to cancel your home groups. And I'm like, what? Wow. Now, I'm like, I'm panicked. And I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. My, my assistant youth pastor is looking at me like his mouth's wide open. Wow. This is the whole focus of our youth ministry for nine, eight months, okay? Yeah. And I'm sitting there going, I told him about it in the parking lot. He said, great. Uh, the couple's pastor, the senior's pastor, the single's pastor, they have their care groups, ours are evangelistic, ours are different. Pastor, you mean accept the youth group, right? Because I told you in the parking lot what we were doing. He said, John, the Holy Spirit's put in my heart that we're not supposed to have home groups. I said, Pastor, we can't get kids from the high wow. school into the schools, into the church. They don't want to go to a church, but they, they'll go to a party. He says, John, the, the Holy Spirit's put it in my heart not to have home groups in this church. I said, but, but Pastor, I can't get kids from the high school. Remember, I went to that that big church in Louisiana. They are growing the fastest growing youth group in America. This, this, we're going to win the whole city of Orlando. I argued with him for 20 minutes in that pastor's meeting. And he kept saying, John, the Holy Spirit's put it in my heart that we're not supposed to have home groups. Finally, I ran out of things to say, Bill. Yeah. And I, and I shut up and I'm steaming mad. I don't hear another thing the rest of the meeting, right? So you can tell I'm Italian. I talk with my hands. So anyway, I'm storming out of the meeting. And one of the wiser, older pastors tries to stop me. And I said, hey, leave me alone. Just, just don't talk to me right now. So I get in the car. I'm driving home. And these thoughts are going through my mind. What does he mean the Holy Spirit told him that we're not supposed to have you? I prayed and God showed me to do it. He's keeping people from getting saved. I mean, all these thoughts are going through yeah, my mind, yeah. right? So I come to my house. I open up the front door. My wife's walking right. Lisa's walking right by the front door, right? I go, you're not going to believe what he did. And she goes, who? And she has this look of terror. Who and what did they do? And I said, Pastor. I said, he just canceled the home groups, the parties, what we've been working on, the whole vision of the youth group for eight months. He just canceled them. He didn't even give me a reason.
reason. And she, you know what Lisa says? She goes, well, looks to me, John, like God's trying to teach you something. And she walks out. And oh, I'm mad at her. I am so <laughs> mad at her. Okay? So she's in the bedroom. And I think, I don't want to be around her unbelief. I go to the kitchen. <laughs> so I'm sitting in the kitchen. I'm looking out the window. And um, I'm going, I can't believe this. this is a nightmare. I'm going to wake yeah. up. This is at ni- yeah. eight months. It's been eight months of work. And I'm only... Yeah. 25 years old or whatever. I don't know. 27 at the time. And the Holy Spirit speaks to me. And he said, whose ministry are you building? Mine or yours? I said, I'm building yours. He said, no, you're not. I said, God, we can't get kids out of high schools into the church. They don't want to go. And I go through the whole sales pitch with God. That's how stupid you are when you're in rebellion. Okay. When you're unbroken, I should say. And so the Lord lets me go through the whole spiel. Yeah. And he said, son. When I put you in this ministry, I made you an extension of this man's arms and of his legs. And he said, the day you stand before me for your time period that I've put you with him, you will not, first of all, be judged on how many souls you won to the Lord in Orlando. You'll, first of all, be judged on how faithful you were to the man I put you under. Wow. Now, look, whoa, whoa, I'm not done. I'm not done. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Just a second. Give me one more. Then he said this to me. He said... Son, you can win every single high school student in Orlando, Florida to Jesus and stand before my throne and be judged and lose credit for every one of them because of your rebellion to the man I put you under. Wow. Now, I'm a Catholic boy, okay? I was raised Catholic, remember? Yeah. I'm quaking at this point, (laughs) okay? And the Lord said, if you keep going the way you're going, you're going to cause a division. And the word division, die, means two visions. And I saw in my spirit the church going this way and the youth group going this way. Wow. Bill, I ran to the phone. I called my senior pastor at home. I said, I am so sorry. I'm in rebellion to God. I'm in rebellion to you. I want you to know I'm so sorry. I, 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 I argue with you. I am canceling these home groups. Wow. He said, oh, I love you so much. And he hung up. I'm like, oh, my gosh, he has no idea what I've gone through. Yeah, yeah. So I have the phone and, I have a, I, and the Lord says this to me. I hear this so clear. He said, how are you going to tell your leaders on Sunday? And I had a vision, Bill, right there. I saw me walking in to the leadership because I had 24 leaders, right, that were going to be over these parties. I'm dragging into the meeting, and I got this heavy voice. Guys, you know we've worked on this for (laughs) eight months, but our pastors canceled the home groups. And I saw them all in the vision go, what? Ah!" And they're mad. And you know who they're mad at? They're mad at him. And they saw, you know, they, they sided with me. Right. Sympathetic towards me. The Holy Spirit says, is that what you're going to do? I said, no, sir. No, 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 no. I walked in that meeting with a skip in my step, twinkle in my eye, and a spark in my voice. I said, guys, I got great news. And they all look at me like, I said, our pastor has spared us from birthing an Ishmael. He has declared the direction of God for our church is not to have home groups. They all went, yeah. And that was it. That was it. We never had a problem. Oh, my gosh. They followed your lead. So so that was the day that a level of breaking occurred in John Bevere's life. Okay? Okay, let me do I'm going to stop you. I'm going to show a quick video. I can talk all night. This is so good. we got John Bevere with us talking about discovering God's purpose. Speaking of that, check out this video. Not far from the Hollywood sign is downtown Los Angeles, where thousands of people live every single day who are homeless. Runaway street kids families, women and children, pimps, pushers. These are the people who have become my cause. My journey started at 20 years of age when my father got a little building in downtown in LA called Bethel Temple. It was a church that nobody wanted. It was filled with gangs around the neighborhood, crime. I'll never forget when I said yes to my dad to come and pastor the church. I got my little Nissan Sentra stick shift and I drove from Phoenix across the desert to LA. And I saw those high-rise buildings. They looked like giants to me. They looked like giants that could never be knocked down. And I was humbled very quickly on my journey when I got here and inherited 18 people. But that was a time where I realized that I had to go through brokenness in order to find my cause. And then one night, as I was weeping for endless hours, the Lord spoke to me. He said, I want you to stop your crying. I want you to get up and I want you to go to Echo Park. 
God speaking to me to go Echo Park was revealing that night. Because it was that night where I walked around and I saw helicopters in the park that were looking for criminals. I saw young boys up against police cars being arrested. It was like God put every hurting person in one park in one night. As I cried out to God, God began to speak to me. He said, if you will build the people, then I will build the church. And I said, what people are you referring to, God? I can't get these people to come to my church. So look around this park. It's all you have to do. Don't have to look far. All you have to do is look everywhere. And everywhere that I looked, I saw broken people in my city. And that was the night where God began to change my life dramatically and began to give me love for people that I never knew that I loved, a cause that I never knew was in me, a dream for people that I never knew that I could even dream for. And that was the night where I thought was the worst moment of my life. That was my rock bottom. But one thing I realized is that God doesn't destroy people in rock bottom. He recreates people in rock bottom. And that was the day where the entire vision began to change. When I told God I just wanted to serve my city, something amazing happened. He said, just serve me with whatever you have. I said, God, I have nothing left. I have no church, I have no secretary, I have no staff. He said, you have a desk and you have a phone. Move your desk and the phone outside on the sidewalk, buy three bags of food and give them away to anybody who has need in your community. When I moved my desk on the sidewalk and had that phone there and started giving away bags of food, that was the beginning of our adopt a block. That was the first block that we adopted, actually the sidewalk next to the church. And then I began to tell people of the church about the joy it is just to serve our community. And then two people took a block, and then four people took another block. And before long, we were adopting blocks all over our neighborhood, just knocking on the doors, telling people, hi, we are neighborhood servants. What can we do to serve you? As we begin to see the needs of people every day, that's when the ministry was born. It wasn't born in a committee room. It wasn't born in a planning room. It was born in the living rooms of people's houses. And that's where we begin to see the shape of the Dream Center begin to take form. When the world sees the church as not a safe place, but a dangerous place, I really believe that's the mark of a great church. When they look at us and say, wow, Sunday morning they go to church, but on Monday morning they're helping the homeless. On Tuesday they're feeding their communities. That's when the church comes alive, when we become a practical component of change in our community. In one day, I'm not kidding you, trucks showed up from TBN saying, we heard about what you're doing. We want to donate this equipment to the Dream Center. We didn't know what to do with it. We didn't even have anyone that could run cameras, but then Matt Crouch came along and said, let me help you tell your story. Let's do it the right way. TBN began to rally. The body of Christ began to respond, and they began to give to support the Dream Center. And before long, we had the resource that allowed us to do all that we do today. I'll never forget when I decided to live homeless on the streets of Skid Row. I lived amongst the cardboard boxes. I lived in the middle of the trash cans with all the homeless people. And there in 48 hours of living homeless, I learned something. That people that are in need don't need the perfect plan. They just need for you to show up. It's amazing what happens when you step out in faith and it feels reckless and sometimes people even doubt you. Sometimes they even criticize you. But you know that it's God's call. And there's people that are crazy enough to come alongside you to believe that your risk of faith is a worthy cause. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Wow. I know. Wow. Unbelievable. I know you've. I know you've spoken at the Dream Center. I've had the privilege of being there too, and it's just an amazing place. And I remember one time someone told me uh, when it comes to reaching the, the people that nobody wants, if you'll reach for the people nobody wants, God will give you the people everybody wants. Yeah. And it's really true, because that's the heart of Jesus. Just reach for the people that nobody Matt wants. Matt is one of the finest men I know. He is. He really is. Him and his father, just their whole family is amazing. Yes. Just what a great ministry. If you're ever out in LA, you gotta go stop by the Dream Center. Oh it's, yeah. It's, it's unbelievable experience. It'll change your life. It really will. Yes. So it's really neat to, to, to hear his story. I love it. You know, we're talking about discovering God's purpose for your life and, and, and really stepping into the calling that God has for you. And, and I want to ask you, uh, John, you, you know, we're talking about, you know, <clears throat> discovering what God has for you. And, and over and over again, you said, and God told me this and God told me that and the Holy Spirit told me this and Jesus spoke this to me. I think there's people right now saying, that sounds really great. Can God actually talk to me? Like I can have a relationship with God. That sounds like a real personal thing. How does that work? Can you, know, you, can you was, help someone understand what that looks like and how they can have that? I, I remember that's what drew me. Um, I'm, in, I'm in college. I'm in my fraternity. I'm raised Catholic. I never miss mass. I'd go to midnight mass drunk and then go back to the party so I wouldn't have to get up with a hangover the next morning. Wow. And here I was playing varsity tennis at Purdue 
and I started on the Purdue varsity tennis team, and one of my fraternity brothers was a phenomenal athlete. And I'll never forget, he came to my room one night with a, four spiritual laws, Campus Crusade for Christ. And he said, Johnny, and it really didn't, it was just all going over my head, because I'm Catholic, I'm saved. You're not even a Christian, you're not Catholic. You know, that kind of thought. <laughs> but anyway, he said to me, he said, this is what broke it, and this is what God used. And I believe this is what God's gonna use to touch you right now. But he said to me, he said, can you tell me about Jimmy Carter, the President of the United States? I said, sure. He's a peanut farmer. His wife's Roslyn. He was a former governor of Alabama. He said, good. He, can you tell me about Jesus? I went, yeah. Uh, Mary's his mother. You know, she's a virgin. And uh, he died on a cross. He had 12 apostles. Right. He said, that's good. He said, do you know President Carter like you know your mother? And I went, what? He said, do you know President Carter like you know your mother? I, I, I said, no. He said, what's the difference? I said, I know my mom. I, I've never met him. And he said to me, do you know Jesus like you know your mother? And I just went, what? And he said, John, God didn't create you to be religious. He created you because he passionately desires an intimate relationship. Wow. And the way the Bible talks about it, I want you to listen to me really carefully. The Bible talks about our relationship with God is like a husband and a wife. So you can know Jesus died on the cross. You can know he's the son of God. You can know his mother was Mary. I knew all that. I knew he was raised from the dead on the third day, but not have a covenant relationship with him. How, how, how can that be? Let me give you an illustration. You can have a girl dating a guy, and that girl, she knows that that guy is an excellent quarterback. She knows that guy has a scar on his forehead from a bicycle accident when he was 12. She knows that guy is an excellent math student. She's been to that guy's house. She's, she's met his siblings. But that doesn't give her a covenant relationship with him. It's not until he gets down on one knee, opens up a little ring box and, and says, will you marry me? At that point, she's got a decision to make. And that's what I'm asking you to do tonight. We are asking you together. She can ignore his proposal and continue life as is, knowing about him, even going to his house and meeting his siblings. But that doesn't give her a covenant relationship. Or she, she can say yes. And if she says yes, it means a couple months later, she's going to put on a white dress, walk down an aisle of a church in front of a lot of people, and she's stay, saying something very significant by doing that. She's saying goodbye to every man on the planet except for the guy waiting for her. She's giving her entire heart, her entire life to him. When Jesus died for us on the cross, when he shed his blood to get us out of slavery, that was him getting down on one knee and saying, would you be my bride, the bride of Christ? Now, at this point, we have a decision to make. We can ignore his proposal or we can say yes. And if we say yes, that means we're going to do what that bride does. We're going to give him our entire heart, our entire life. I believe there are people watching right now. You, you may have even prayed a sinner's prayer, but you know, you know you haven't given him your entire life. That's what it truly means to become a child of God. Don't let anybody ever fool you. Don't ever take false security in just praying a coin prayer, but not having your heart totally be his. It's a relationship. What makes my wife and my relationship so rich is I've given my entire heart and life to her. She's given me her entire heart and life. That's what makes your relationship with God so rich. And that's what he desires. That's why he created you. So if that's you right now and you'd say, John, truthfully, I've not given my entire heart and life to Jesus. I want you to pray with Bill and I right now. We're going to lead you in a prayer. Say this with me. God in heaven, thank you so much for sending Jesus. Forgive me for living life my way apart from you, my creator. But this day, I give my spirit, my soul, my body, everything I am and everything I own to you, Jesus Christ. Today, I receive you as my Lord, which will make you my savior. Thank you for welcoming me into your family. I turn away from those things you don't like. I will no longer entertain those in my life. I am giving myself to you, and my life now shall be lived to please you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise God. Wow. Incredible. Praise God. 
If you just made that decision, if you just prayed that prayer a few moments ago, first of all, John, thank you so much for sharing that. What an incredible prayer and just leading those to, to, to Christ because TBN is all about taking Jesus to everyone, every hour of the day, all over the world. And so we just want to hear about your decision to follow Christ. And the next step, of course, is to go find a good Bible-believing church. There should be lots of them located all around you. Praise God, we have them uh, all over America, but also all over the world. And so just ask around. Someone let you know where there's a good church. I want to encourage you. We'd love to hear from you here uh, as well. Uh, so just, you know, email us if you would. Let us know. Give us a call. We'd love to hear from you about your decision. And, you know, on, on behalf of Matt and Lori Crouch and the entire TBN networks, I just want to say we're so glad for the decision you made. That is what this is about. That's why we are here. It is all about Jesus all day, all night. That's what we believe in. Right. And so we're so grateful for the decision that you made. And maybe today, I just want to mention this real quick too. You know, we've had some incredible conversations with John and he has such a phenomenal ministry. And, and you know, John, I just want to just take a moment and just, and just pray uh, for those who are just hurting. They say, I know Christ, man, I feel like what I just experienced in talking with you. Someone may be watching this thinking, wow, this guy really is walking with him. And I feel so distant. I feel so disconnected. And you can get connected with the Lord again. It's real simple. You just give God your whole heart. It's not complicated. And I don't want to make it complicated. It's simply you just saying, Jesus, I'm coming back to you. I want to come back to you. You never lose Christ when he's in your heart, when you've received him. But I'll tell you what does happen is we distance ourselves yeah. because of the behaviors where we walk away from him. We begin to make our lives about ourselves. Well, you know, think about you it. If I, if I do something very offensive to Lisa yeah. and I just act as if nothing happened and I keep doing that offensive. Yeah. I may still be married to her, right. okay? But I have severely damaged yeah. our intimacy. Yeah. And what I desire more than anything else is I desire my wife to look at me when her head's on yeah. that pillow and share the secrets of her heart. Yeah. The reason I don't want to hurt Jesus, the reason I don't want to commit yeah. adultery with the world, yeah. It's because I don't ever want to lose that intimacy. And exactly. that's what you cry out for. That's what that's you it. were created for. And that's why nothing can satisfy you. Not success, not even a successful ministry. Yeah. You were created to walk with God, to be intimate with Him. And you will never be fully satisfied until you do. And so I'd love to pray yeah. with you right now. Just say this with me. God in heaven, forgive me for straying from your heart. Today I'm returning to you. Yes. I know you've not abandoned me and I know I've been your child all through this, but our fellowship has been hindered because of my unwise behavior, my sinful behavior. I repent of that today and I come back to you with all my heart in Jesus' name. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus for every single person that is suffering from sickness, disease, from infirmity in their body. I speak to the demonic forces. I see demon spirits tormenting some people right now. I demand you get out of that house. It's good. Get out of their dreams. Get out of their head. Leave. That is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I command you in Jesus' name to go. And now, Father, I release, we release, Bill and I agree, That's right. and we release healing power and anointing into the lives of every single person under the sound of our voice. Yes. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 At TBN, our mission is to use every available means to reach as many individuals and families as possible with the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for helping make the gospel of grace go around the world. Without you, we couldn't do it. God bless you.